So I'd like to give it a chance to welcome a good friend of ours, Jarrett, to the stage here. He not only gave uh, one of the workshops earlier, he's actually here to give our keynote. So please welcome Jared to the stage. All right. Let's see if we can get this mic in a good position. So um, awesome to be here. Thanks to Tim and David and Gio, uh, all the TourCon staff. Let's give them a round of applause for putting this together. So, you know, it's interesting when you put together a keynote talk, it's kind of like, should I go deep in any particular subject, right? You don't want to do that for a keynote. It's kind of more of a overlook across the field. And I've been in this field for 16 years, so I kind of have that unique perspective that can I lean? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Maybe I'll... Is this good enough if I just keep it here, or should I hold it? Is that okay? Okay. Oh. Okay. We'll try this. Check. Okay. Um, restart. So... Keynote, uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of, you know, shed light across the industry. Instead of just giving a deep dive talk in like hacking or software auditing or malware analysis or hardware hacking or anything that you may hear, uh, get a chance to do, you know, deeper, more hands-on in a training or in some of the other talks throughout the con, a keynote is a great opportunity to kind of give that perspective. And there's a couple of subjects that have been kind of hot the last couple of years. Um, one of them that came to mind was DevOps, this whole, like, do we still do SDL and security and DevOps like we used to in sort of regular software security? And, of course, the, the other thing is endpoint security, next-gen endpoint security. What's up with that? We hear a lot about that lately. And so I kind of wanted to touch on those two topics. And so that's why uh, this talk. So I wanted to talk about what's being done, what's being used across those, what the new hotness is, and is it really that hot? Uh, because I have a passion to make security better. Like I said, I've been in the field a long time, and I really love this field. I love coming out to these, love meeting people, so stop by and say hi. And I, I really have a heart to try to make things better across the industry. Um, and sometimes that means breaking things and hacking things and pulling them apart like we do. And other times it just means staying, staying abreast of what's going on in the field and learning and moving a little faster than the adversaries are learning and moving. So, um, you know, in terms of what's new, first of all, and is it working? There's been a lot of changes. There always is. This field moves so fast, right? When you look across um, devices and code, what's going on with processors and Intel and Microsoft and other operating system vendors, what new mitigations? We heard a lot about ASLR in depth the last many years, and then there's new things like isolated heap and CFG, and I'll talk a little bit about those. I won't go into all the details because not everybody is super familiar with every niche domain in our industry, but I'll touch on some of those. And then, of course, apps and rapid deployment and getting things out really quickly. And this whole idea of bug bounties. We see, like, even companies like, like a taxi company, essentially that's what Uber is, right? They have a bug bounty. It's really weird, right? Only in our generation is this sort of thing happening. This wouldn't have happened even 10 years ago. We wouldn't see a, a taxi company asking hackers to, like, try and hack their website. It's just not a thing that would have been done. So there's a lot of cool things that are taking place. Um, with things like two-factor authentication and how to do rapid incident response and even regulation is something that's kind of new and starting to happen and there's some real debate about that. We talk about debate in the political arena, we have that in our own little field and community too, right? Like should there be regulation around software security? Some say yes there should because without it anybody can basically build something and ship it, right? And others say well we don't really want that because that would stifle innovation and open source and all of that. So I think there's a healthy debate uh, that can be had there. There's also a lot of other healthy debates around privacy and security. Um, I was on Bloomberg West recently talking about the whole Snowden incident, so like whether that was ultimately good or bad. Um, you know, th those sort of debates, you can go look that up if you want to see, you know, what I had to say about that. And of course, a lot of the new technologies that are always kind of coming out to help address these or try and help address with these, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. So we see that even though our industry has made a lot of progress, and we have a lot of cool new tools and techniques and expertise. 
we see that it hasn't helped as much as maybe we'd hope, right? There's all kinds of breaches happening still, whether it's in Yahoo or the OPM thing if you have a clearance or there's, you know, mobile phones or car manufacturers. There's still a lot going on. So that's kind of what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about where we are with some of these subjects and, and where we can go with it. So first, who am I? Um, wow. Th this was interesting. So um, I don't know how many of you guys have been around this a long time, but uh, this was actually a number, a, a few years back, probably 2012, I think. Microsoft had a Blue Hat prize contest thing. And I ended up placing third in their contest. So afterwards, I, I, they had a big party, and there was a DJ up on stage playing the drums. And I was like, dude, let me on stage. Let me up with you. He's like, no, dude, nobody comes on stage while I'm jamming. And I was like, come on, I just won, like, you know, third in this contest. Let me up. And so he finally let me up, and I started jamming with him. And it was actually pretty, I think he was surprised that I actually had rhythm, because I actually used to play drums in high school and stuff. So we actually had a pretty good jam up there. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd throw that in there. That was pretty fun. Uh, that's not what I'm best known for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can make a living doing that. Um, I'm best known for being a hacker, a builder, a trainer. I do a lot of teaching at conferences and stuff like that. Um, I'm the CTO of BDS and the founder of VDA Labs and a Pluralsight author, and I teach at university as well. So I've got a bunch of things that I'm involved in. I'm happy to talk to you more about that, but I don't want to make this talk about me. I want to get into um, the topics at hand. And one of the, one of the issues that I see... Um, in our field, and this is really like the TLDR, right? So if you fall asleep halfway through this talk, like this is the summary of the entire talk. I'll just give you the summary up front so you can you know, happily doze for a little bit. I know it's early. So one of the things that I want to point out is our, our software security and endpoint security, or, or in other words, like manufacturing things like operating systems and software, is that very separate than enterprise security, endpoint security, firewall security, network security, whatever it is. And they, they are in some ways, right, in our industry, they're treated very separately. The people that work on one don't work on the other. There's not much cross-pollination, right? A, a, like a, a software security person that works at Google or Microsoft doesn't ever go and work in like enterprise security, generally speaking, right? And, and like work in a SOC or configure a firewall or... They're, they're kind of separate, but they maybe shouldn't be so separate because it's all needs to work together to make this thing uh, safer. And so I've got this little stack. Right of, of, and I don't know how well you can read the slides, but I'll, I'll point it out. And if you start kind of at the very end of the stack, that is basically an attacker's on your system, and you want to like search for logs, or try to protect things with VMs, or run some antivirus, or something like Emmet. That's what that whole Blue Hat Prize contest thing, a lot of the research that came out of that went into a tool that Microsoft made called Emmet, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, and it was all about trying to stop ROP exploits. So some of the research I did kind of went into that, so I, I kind of feel somewhat prideful that I helped make this industry a little bit safer with some of, the, some of the research I've done. So that was pretty cool. But ultimately, those aren't the best places to do security. In other words, once somebody's in your, in your network or on your system, you can like, find them and detect them or like, stop the attack or whatever. Like, that's, that's like the hardest place to stop an attacker, right? I mean, when you think about it, right? It would be like, better and ultimately cheaper, and this is really my call to action and my sort of takeaway if you fall asleep, uh, it, to work upstream, basically. If we made things secure by design or safer from the get-go so that a lot of the vulnerabilities that happened just couldn't happen, that would essentially mitigate the need downstream for all these other tools and techniques and technologies and people and all this other stuff that are being done. Now, of course, that's not really ever going to happen exactly, right? We're never going to be able to design a perfect system, right, and make a system totally secure. So there's always going to be a need for these security products and security companies and security staff. And like that'll always be a need. I'm not trying to say that that's not a need. But what I am trying to say and what, where my sort of call to action and sort of try to motivate you a little bit is how can you think in your field, and it's different for every person, where you're at, what you're doing, but how can you think a little bit about how can I work upstream a little bit? I'll give you an example of that. I know a guy, um, really, really smart, really good in software security. And he was looking at taking a job at yet another company. Um, I don't know if it was, you know, because they paid good or whatever it was. But he decided he could apply his skills 
to actually like you know like making patches and pull requests and stuff to the Linux kernel because he's really good at like kernel security and stuff like that. And he decided that if he worked as far as he could upstream, like on the actual kernel, that stuff ends up in Google, that stuff ends up on your car, that instead of like working at the car company or whatever he was going to do, he realized that if he worked upstream somehow, he could actually make a bigger difference across the entire planet in terms of code security, right? And that thinking is pretty forward thinking. I don't think most of us think like that. I think most of us just think like, hey, I can make a buck at this company, right, or whatever. And we don't really think about how can I kind of work upstream a little bit. And it might not, doesn't necessarily mean you need to be good at kernel security, right? That could mean that instead of finding yet another cross-site scripting vulnerability, maybe you work on Docker a little bit and help make app deployment a little more secure, or whatever. How, however it is in your industry, in your field, in your, with your skill set and your domain, Think a little bit more about how can I kind of work up this stack. Like I could work, you know, maybe with the hardware and trusted computing, or I could work on compiler security enhancements, right, to GCC or, or with the operating system itself. Or we had ASLR and DEP, which were some exploit mitigations. And Microsoft has a new thing to, that's kind of meant to supplant Emmet and some of the other stuff they've done called Control Flow Guard, which is all about control flow integrity. So trying to enforce the actual execution of a program to be sort of semantically sound rather than just, hey, so I just overwrote this function pointer. I can jump to anywhere and do a stack pivot and start a ROP chain, and now I have code execution on your computer. All that madness that can take place. Otherwise, we could stop some of that from ever even happening, and then we wouldn't have to go and detect attacks and make sandboxes and do a lot of the other stuff we do because we, it wouldn't happen in the first place. So that's, it's not always, it's not like, like I said, it's not going to completely happen. We're still going to need detection and all these other things, but that's, that's, that's my sort of summary of the entire talk. So let me, let me uh, move beyond the summary and kind of get into a little bit more of the specifics then. Um, one of the things I hear a lot, and it makes me laugh hard, is I ask somebody like, so hey, do you do like SDL or security where you work? And they're like, oh no, we're agile. And that kind of makes me laugh because I'm like, okay, so you don't need security because you do agile or you do DevOps, and so security is just not a thing for you, I guess. Okay, cool, fine. Um, Though, to balance the discussion, there is some merit to what they're saying. In other words, what they're saying is we can't spend a year-long waterfall, traditional software design, SDL, expensive, heavyweight thing because we're pushing out code like every week. So that doesn't work for us. Fine. I get that. I'm, I'm on board with that. But you, I, I think you can still do security. And so I'll briefly walk through some of the SDL steps, and we'll hopefully see that they still apply to rapid development, which is what things, what people do nowadays. People don't really spend like a year writing software and shrink it in a box and put it on the store at Walmart and people come in and buy it and they like just, you know, run it on their computer in a closed environment. Like that doesn't, that era is gone, right? The shrink wrap and ship and stuff, that, that time has done, has done now. Uh, we live in an era where if you didn't think about security from the get-go um, and you didn't think about how am I going to update this on the fly, then you didn't do it right, basically, okay? Because you're going to have to think about how can, I sh how can I patch my product over the air. So, like, for example, when uh, Chris and Charlie did their Jeep hack, Chrysler had to actually bring all those Jeeps into a dealership and, like, plug a USB key in, and they had to patch it and fix the bug, right? It was kind of less than ideal. Where Tesla's had a number of bugs, but they've not made a big deal of it. They just patch them over the air. So they had a little better patching strategy, right? And I think that's the wave of the future is viewing, Tesla views themselves as a software company, not an auto manufacturer, right? And that is the future, right? That idea of, hey, we build software and we know how to update it, you know, in real time. So um, one of the other things I hear is, oh, well, you know, we make stuff so fast we don't have time for security. And, and, and we'll talk about that. Like, that's not necessarily a bad thing that you're able to push things so rapidly because you can push fixes so rapidly too. So will we still need antivirus or AV or Emmet or something like that in automobiles? I hope not. Um, that's not ideal, right? I don't want yet another, like, McAfee product in my automobile. I didn't want it on my desktop to begin with. Like, I don't want it in my car for sure. No offense if you work for McAfee, but... Um, it is what it is, right? But I think that's the world we're headed toward, right? Because there's still not enough security baked into our products that you probably will have an IDS on your CAN bus at some point or something, right? That's, we're headed toward that, just so you know. And it's not a bright future, but that's, we're moving toward that. So I think we still have time to avoid that if we get enough people involved in the right places that work upstream enough. And that's why I keep talking about that upstream thing, because it has to be done there. 
doing it later on by putting an IDS on the CAN bus, it's, that's more of the same, right? And it's not progress, in my opinion. A lot of people would probably want to throw me off stage for saying that, right? Because they work for a vendor that wants to do that, but it's just my opinion. So, okay. Um, having said that, this is my balancing slide that yes, we still probably might have to, okay? We might have to have those, we design it best we can, but still have some kind of a sensor in the car that detects if things go wrong, like essentially an IDS or something, right? We might still need that because defense in depth, we, we've shown that we're not able to do it right at any one layer. So having multiple layers probably is still necessary. History shows us the way on that. It's just not, um, it's not as exciting to me. I would rather see a culture where you've got a team and this can work in small businesses, right? This can work in a business where you've only got two or three developers and you don't have the big SDL budget and you don't have a full-time security engineer on staff. You don't have any SDL heavyweight stuff. This can still work. You just have to have the right desire, the right people, the right dedication, the right mandate, the right response. All, all of that um, has to be done. And it has to, it's harder, I think, for small businesses in some way because basically the developer has to also be the security expert. It's kind of a tall order. I think it's possible. I've seen it done. Uh, but it, 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 it's, you know, it's kind of a tall order. So you have to start with training. You have to start with deep technical uh, engineering security, basically skilled people, and have also some time and budget to go back through and do, even if it's not heavyweight SDL. This is what I'm trying to point out for DevOps and Agile. You still need time. You still need training. You still need budget to do that. You also need experience. You need somebody um, that has the performance of, of past you know, work in security projects, dealing with authentication, rules, data, all of that stuff. It only comes with time, right? I mean, somebody directly out of college may not have that, so you, you might have to actually invest in people a little bit to grow the people you need. So that's, kind of, uh, that's sort of not changed, right? Whether we're doing Agile or we're doing you know, some other uh, waterfall or whatever, that whole thing hasn't really changed. So, we need people that have the um, knowledge about how to integrate that into our process. If we're going to be releasing code every couple of weeks, we need to know how to do that in a way that's sane and secure and safe and have the right processes in place to do that. Because not every bit of code, and this is the whole like, thing with agile development, not every bit is truly security sensitive. right? If you're making an Angry Birds app and your first thing is birds just fire, and then your next thing is now you have colored birds that can fire or whatever, and you're pushing updates every two weeks to your mobile app or whatever, that's fine for the most part. There's really no big security issue with that. But you need somebody on staff that goes, oh, and by the way, on, on, in 1.3, we're going to pull information out of your context and shoot birds at like people in our contact list or something. Now it's like, oh, whoa, hold up. Now we need to think about that, right? Do we really want to just throw that out next week without the right testing? Because that sounds like a privacy issue. That sounds like it has security implications. And only people that have been around this industry would pick up on that so quickly, I think. So what tools and processes can we have to catch those things before we decide to ship that? We have somebody with the right experience to, to figure that out. And that comes with maturity. It comes with the right hiring. It comes with the right workflow. Um, Chris Romeo says that security is a journey, not a destination. And I agree with that, right? It's, it's any sort of maturing process, right, takes time. It's not something that you're just like, hey, we figured out security. We're all done this week. We can all go home. We're done. No. We still need, we still need to be on that journey. We still need to be doing the right sort of engineering and figuring out what type of testing, whether it be static testing, static code analysis, or whether it be dynamic uh, code analysis, you know, what is the right amount of engineering for us in our process? For example, with native code, we've known for a long time, and there were a few talks yesterday if you came to the seminars about fuzzing. So memory corruption and fuzzing, that's been a thing for a long time in native code. Hopefully we know that. If you're writing code in C and C++, you ought to know a lot about that. On the other hand, most of the new code we see being written, uh, or not most, but a lot of it is managed code, right? It's web code, it's .NET, it's C Sharp, and it's all that. So Fuzzing is a different thing, right? The way we test, it's different, and we need people with the experience that understand the subtleties and the differences behind that. We need more end-to-end. -end. We need to understand how does Docker help our rapid deployments? How is fraud going to be an issue for Uber? Or, you know, any sort of mobile app thing. We're not necessarily looking for crashes and buffer overflows and stuff like that. The type of security testing we do is going to be very different than what we've done before. We still need both, and we still need people that understand both, but you need domain experts, as always. And that kind of stuff is best done in the engineering process up front, right? It's sort of worse done, just like with product security, the worst place to catch an attack is like later on when you're reviewing the logs or some incident response or something. You're not gonna, like, it's, it's good that you can go back and catch it. We need to do that. 
but it's like too late, right? The, the attack already happened. So <clears throat> in terms of pen testing your own code, it's better to do you know, the bulk of it in-house, like peer review and all of that in testing and stuff. You still want to do a third-party pen test right, of your code in your app, but that's the most expensive, worst way to catch all of your bugs. It's better if it's just baked into your process, right? And that makes sense. We need to do all those things still, but, but it's better to do them up front. So um, to kind of summarize a little bit, having a, uh, as far as DevOps and, and SDL goes, having a support plan, super important, right? Having a patching plan, super important. Uh, having an instant response, communication, a partnership with industry like bug bounties, that's kind of a new thing still. A lot of companies are still kind of looking at that and evaluating that and trying to figure out if that makes sense for them, if they have budget for that, if they really want to get involved in that and be public about their bugs and kind of admit to the world that they might have bugs. It's kind of s strange that we're still, you know, there's st we're still having that discussion, right? Because I think like any forward-thinking company would know that they're going to have bugs in their product, and they'd be okay with that. They would rather engage the community than sort of try to sweep it under the rug. But that that discussion is still very much ongoing. So you're probably going to have that in your organization if you're involved with that. So yes, in summary, for you builders, for you people that do agile and DevOps, yes, you still need security, even if it's an MVP, right, a minimal viable product, a small thing that you're just shipping out the littlest parts for. You can still think about it all this front. You just have to be more creative, and if, especially if you're a small business. You might not be able to afford full-time security engineers to sit on staff with you and stuff like that. So you're going to have to be a little more creative, and you're going to have to think about what can we do kind of upfront or upstream that helps make this whole thing better rather than just kind of like ship it and then we'll like look for cross-site scriptings afterwards by hiring a pen test team to come blow up our product, which you know is going to happen, right, if you didn't think about it in the first place. So thinking about it up front is kind of where we're at. So let's change gears to endpoints. All right, so... What does next gen mean anyway? We hear that a lot, right? There's next gen firewalls, there's next gen WAFs, there's next gen IDS, there's next gen endpoint security. There's a, there's a lot of next gen. And what does it really mean? Well, I guess we have to first define what was prior gen, right? So when you think about HIPs and HIDs, firewalls, personal firewalls, IDS here on the host, antivirus, uh, particularly looking at files with known bad hashes, kind of like a list of bad things that will block if we ever see this file. That, for sure, is like prior gen, right? Because all it takes is a recompile, and then the file's got a new hash, and the malware gets through, right? So we know that that didn't really catch all the things. And that's why there's been this push for something that does something else, or, or at least does more, right? Um, so that's, that's where this next gen terms come from. So what do we have for next gen? What, what type of capabilities? If you work in enterprise, and you're looking at endpoints, and you're thinking, hey, we should go out and look at next-gen stuffs. What kind of features, you know, or products? I'm not going to name names like particular vendors or products. I'm not going to, you know, even go there. But what are the types of features that you could go and look for? Well, there's functional runtime analysis. Uh, something like Emmet, for example, it does API analysis. So looking at how functions work. There's isolation technologies like sandboxes or VMs. So security through isolation. There's all sorts of novel detections, either statically or behavioral. And there's uh, various versions of math that you can throw on there, right, to analyze binaries with machine learning, either statically or uh, you might have some other attack your heuristics, more behavioral type of, of technologies based on sort of known techniques in the industry. So we'll talk briefly about each one of these. Again, I'm not trying to pitch you on any one of these. Um, I leave you to completely draw your own conclusions about you know, what you think might be best for your organization. I just wanted to have the discussion because I've actually worked for a couple different next-gen endpoint security products, so I feel like I can bring a fairly unbiased opinion to the matter and just kind of give you some of the data, like here's just how some of these things work. You go and look at them yourself. So. Um, I can mention Emmet for API protection. There are commercial products too, but Emmet's free and stuff, so I can say that one without, and, you know, without getting in trouble, I think, on this one. So the, the use case is basically the way Emmet works, if you don't know, and I certainly don't have to exp time to like, go into detailed explanations of all these. But they do some analysis at certain checkpoints, right? So a program's running, and they've hooked certain APIs like Virtual Protect, which is a, a way that you can change page permissions in Windows. So when Virtual Protect's called, I'd like to make sure that the stack pointer still points to the stack. And if it doesn't, I think I'm under attack. I think there's a ROP attack taking place. A pivot just took place, and I'm going to crash the program. Okay, That's sort of how API type 
technologies work. And it's kind of next gen. It's an exploit mitigation sort of thing, right? It's not something that AV did in the past. Um, or you could have a different sort of technology, but also watching certain APIs, like anti-ransomware thing, that if I ever see the API call that deletes the shadow files, in other words, the backups on your computers, because all ransomware does that, right? Before they encrypt your junk, they blow away any backups to make sure that you can't like, just recover. So if I ever see that called, because that doesn't get called normally, like nobody wants to do that. Like no legitimate enterprise product wants to blow, blow away your backups. If I see that called, I think there's a ransomware about or in flight actually running right now. So let me, let me find the process that called that and kill that process. So you could write a kernel driver that did that. So that's kind of cool. Um, my thoughts on those approaches, um, they're pretty easy to implement relatively. I mean, none of this is easy, right? Let's be honest. If you're not a developer, none of this is going to be easy. But like relatively, those things are fairly easy for a development company to stand up and get going. They have relatively uh, low impact on your system and performance if they're done right. Um, that you could also screw it up if you hook too many APIs and you can, you can you could, like, make processes crawl if you do it wrong. But if you do it right, um, the cons are that both of those are fairly easy to bypass. And the reason is you're basically, like, there's an attack in flight. So somebody has, like, successfully run an exploit, and they're in the process of, like, running a ROP chain or, like, doing a ransomware, and you're trying to, like, stop it, like, as it's happening. It's not the best theoretical place to stop an attack, right? Because if they've got some access, maybe they can just not call that API or do it in a slightly different way that your thing isn't looking for, and then they can bypass your thing. So in general... And I've done this a lot. Like, I've, you know, I've spent a significant part of my career sort of looking at products and going, oh, this is interesting. How can I bypass it? And usually you can, right? Usually you can, like, if you just reason about whatever it is, right? And we see this all across our industry, right? It's not just software. We see it in physical, like, there's a door lock. And we see, we've seen the videos where the guy, like, blows, you know, like, I don't know, some water or whatever through the door. And it trips the internal sensor in the door and locks, and he just walks in. Like, that, those sort of, like... So there's a security thing. How can I either turn it off or bypass it? That's how we work. That's how our sick, twisted minds kind of operate. So, um, The recommendation on these kind of technologies is like, well, if it's free, why not, right? Like Emmet was a free tool that Microsoft put out. So it was particularly helpful to like XP because it brought apps up to a like Windows 7 like security standard. They, they enforced ASLR and DAP. It wasn't just API checking. Emmet did some other things too. So like why not, right? Because a lot of these products don't just do one thing. They, a lot of times they do multiple things. So um, it's kind of dying though. Emmet, just so you know, Windows is basically putting all their eggs in, in a basket called CFG with Windows 10. That's their new like security in, in terms of stopping memory corruption control flow guard. I can talk to you about it later. I don't really have time to go into what that is and how it works deeply now. But that's they're kind of moving in a different direction as a company. But um, so that, those are kind of my thoughts on that. How about some other things? I've got about three, three different more sort of next gen approaches that you could think about. How, the, how do they work? How about sandboxing? What is that good for? Uh, the idea with sandboxing is to trap native code vulnerabilities in a lower privileged environment. And it's a good idea. All these, all these ideas are sort of tried and true sound sort of ideas in the security industry. That's why we did VLANs, just so you know, right? Because we don't want everybody on the same hub. Right? So isolating people or separating people or putting them in least privileged containers is a good idea. We've done it for a long time in other domains, so um, do that. There are some commercial products for it, which was a little confusing to me because the operating system basically gives you this, right? So like Chrome and IE, and they all do this. They put each tab runs in a lower privileged sandbox relative to the master browser process. So my uh, thoughts on it are like it's a good idea. It enhances security. It's not perfect. Uh, they're weak against kernel vulnerabilities. Usually you can escape the sandbox. Um, it typically is expensive. It requires some re-architecting the app. Like, hey, you can make your app secure if you just spend all this money and time making it more secure. Okay, well, true. Not every product and company is going to want to do that. So that's kind of the downside. Um, I feel like it's sort of best done by the makers of the app and the OS rather than third-party vendors, but uh, your mileage may vary on that. What about other sorts of more extreme versions of sandboxing? So besides just putting things in a kernel-enforced sandbox, um, in a lot of people there's confusion, I think, across the industry. There's been some confusion for a number of years now. There's actually a difference between like a, a Docker container that uses kernel-enforced sandbox and an actual true VM, right, a hypervisor-enforced VM. There's, there's a difference between the two, just so you know. I think a lot of people... Uh, I talk to people and they don't get that. They haven't. It takes a little bit of time to like really understand the difference. The difference is, 
if you find a vulnerability in a sandbox, if it's a kernel vuln, you can usually get out to the host, like, because there's nothing else. If you find the vulnerability in a uh, hyper, or like in a VM, you have to like get a kernel exploit to get root and then find a hypervisor vulnerability to get out of the hypervisor as well. So there's like a whole other layer, basically, you have to get out of. So um, there's some commercial products. Microsoft is looking at this with what they call VBS, virtual, virtual based security. Um, it, it provides uh, stronger security than sandboxing. So that part of it, like especially in terms of memory corruption, um, is good. Um, it tends to break workflows, tends to be complicated, tends to be expensive, right? Those are sort of, so my, my thoughts on this are, um, you know, the pros are that it definitely is stronger than, say, sandbox enforcement in terms of stopping memory corruption bugs. But memory corruption bugs are not as prevalent as they used to be anyway. So some people argue, well, do I really need that extra, like, 0.01% of security? Like a sandbox, in Chrome, running on Windows 10, latest everything is pretty good. Do I need to like wrap it in a VM too? Particularly if um, that's gonna break my workflow and break my document, my macros can't call out to a database, and like a lot of the things that used to work might get broken in your environment based on that. So there may be some deployment issues basically is the huge con there. So I would, my recommendation with, with virtual based security is use it with care. I think it has a place, uh, particularly as like a malware cage. It works pretty good for that because you can throw some malware in there and blow it up and it won't get out to your host, generally speaking. So it has a lot of like use cases that are like really sound. Um, but I would say, you know, look into that and make sure it works for you and your environment. What about next gen de detection? What about static analysis? Like looking at the binary and say, hey, when I see this executable come to my machine, I'm gonna run some magic math on it and then I'm gonna detect that it's bad. Like, is that good, heuristics, machine learning? Or is it better to sort of let it run in some way and go, I'm gonna look back through the events after it's run, and if I ever saw it do this, 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 or this, then I know it did that, lateral movement or whatever, right? You, so there's behavioral sorts of detection, kind of pre or post execution. You could combine the two as well. There's probably product companies doing that too. But those are sort of the general approaches. Basically either I've got the people on staff that know about APT and pen testing and all this stuff to do behavior, or I've got the math and the science and we're gonna figure this out before the thing ever even runs. Um, the other thing is with all of these products, and I didn't mention it before, but with any of these sort of next gen whatevers, a lot of them aren't just on-prem anymore. A lot of them can like run in the cloud, which means that basically they'll report back to some SOC not in your workplace. So which is better for your environment to have sort of the on-prem or the off-prem uh, approach in terms of how the reporting, the analysis, the logging, dealing with the tuning, the false positives, looking through the alarms, the alerts, who does, who does that? Who's gonna deal with that? Um, is it gonna be you or is it gonna be an MSSP, basically? It's, and both are fine, by the way. I'm not trying to, as I said, I'm actually, I'm actually trying to just give you the data. I'm trying to be completely unbiased. I'm not trying to like pitch you on one or the other. I'm just saying these are the options we have in our field these are the options we have in an industry. The one that works for you may not work for them. You know, well, especially when you think about like small business, they probably don't have their own SOC, right? So maybe the MSSP option really is better for them. Is it medium business maybe? So larger business, maybe they already have a really high tech SOC and they'd rather deal with it themselves. Okay, right? I'm not telling you what, which one is best. I'm saying these are the options. Also, in terms of those, all those detective things that we can do on an endpoint, do you want the haystack or do you want the needle? And again, I'm not necessarily saying one's better than the other, I'm just saying those are your options because there's products that do both. And they both have pros and cons, right? The haystack is kind of an issue in terms of, so, well, let me just, I'll, I'll give you the pros first. So the, the pros of any of those, depending on which one you go with, is that it gives you visibility into stuff that you probably would have missed before, right? Your AV and stuff like that, they're not doing all that stuff. So, cool, enhanced visibility, that's awesome. Um, that's definitely a huge pro. Some of the cons, especially with the haystack, is you probably get a lot of data. So you're gonna have to have a huge server rack and it's gonna be expensive and like you're gonna have, somebody's gonna have to deal with that, right? On the other hand, if you just get the needle, you, if you miss needles and you'd like to later go back and do in some incident response or whatever, it might not be enough. So there's definitely a trade-off. There's definitely pros and cons. And my recommendation on, on both of those would be consider the workflow, consider which, which is gonna work best for you, for your team, for your SOC. Um, and, and consider, you know, what are the features that all of those products have? Are there certain products that combine different elements? Like, can some of them, if they do detect something, they can take the node offline? There's a lot of, like, you know, features and buzzwords and stuff like that that could, may or may not be uh, truly useful and helpful to your organization. So look into those. 
and see which ones can work best for you. Also consider tuning, because all of these next-gen tools, all of them across the whole industry, they're all pretty new. There's a lot of money is being spent in the industry over the last three or four years just to like build all these next-gen products that are going to replace AV. But a lot of them need some tuning and some work and like some deployment setup and like it's not going to come easy. You, it's going to just so you know, in full disclosure, right? It's going to take you some work to get them to get them set up. So how's that going to work for you? And who's going to deal with that? Is it going to be them? Are they going to deal with it in their sock, or is it going to be you? Are you going to deal with the tuning? Tuning is like you know how you deal with the alarms because not every alarm is important to your environment. For one environment, they get an alarm and they're like, oh, that's really bad for us. For another environment, they get a certain kind of alarm and they go, eh, it doesn't matter to us. We don't, that's not a threat to us, so. Okay, so, but somebody's gonna have to know that and deal with that, right? It doesn't just magically work, even though it's next gen. So, uh, there's gonna be a need for us security people for a long, long time to deal with that sort of stuff. The other thing is kind of very similar to detection, which is search, right? So, ignore the commodity sort of junk and just go hunting. And see, that's, that's a big thing. A lot of organizations, they have a hunt team, and they're going to do hunting and threat intelligence and all this cool stuff. It's all cool stuff. Um, but how does it work relative to the other stuff, to protection and detection and all, you know, all the other stuff? Do you have like a plan that sort of makes cohesive sense? And uh, how are you going to find those unusual things in your environment? Which type of technology is going to help you do that best? So the pros on search are that it's cool. It gives you the retroactive incident response. It gives you other things like IT discovery that you might not have had before, search across your enterprise. Uh, the cost, of course, is the same with the, the other sort of big data products, which is like, you know, it's going to cost you money to set it all up and store all those things and look through all the things. You're going to have to have experienced people that know how to do hunting. All of that stuff doesn't come, come for free. So I would, my recommendation there is if you think you want to do that, Compare it to the other detective type technologies and see what makes sense for you to give yourself an honest um, representation of what kind of people do we have on staff. Like maybe we don't have the people to deal with a haystack. Let's just go with something that gives us the needle or, or vice versa, right? Whatever's good for you is, is kind of my thought. So to summarize, I'm kind of to the end. I, found, I, I made it through all that. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, when you, when you want to you know, have a plan for your enterprise in terms of security, so Think about what's your, what's your tool agnostic plan, first of all. So don't start with, hey, we're going to buy this, and then we're going to find a way to wedge it into our environment. It's not the best way to do that, right? So start with, a, hey, this is the people we have, and this is the tools that we think, the types of technologies we think we need. And then once you've done that, then you can consider each layer in the solution and figure out, What's going to be best for us? Is there a certain suite that works? Are there various point solutions? Are there various people we could hire? Like approaching things a little bit more methodically, even in that sense, is slightly more upstream, not you know, as far as I was talking about before, but a little earlier in the process is a good way to go. And then are you going to buy that or build that? Because for some of these ideas, for some of the search and detection, you could probably build some of that stuff too. I know organizations that have done some of that. If you've got super highly skilled developers and whatever, I, software people and stuff on staff, you could even build some of your own detective stuff. So there's always that option, and it's something that every organization, big or small, should to take an honest look at and, and see where they're at. So my final summary for both the uh, sec software security and the endpoint security side is to us as an industry, I'd love to see us stay classy, right? So there's a lot of FUD in our industry. There's a lot of marketing. And it's, a lot, it's very hard for, just so you know, if you're on the other side of it, if you're an IT buyer or something, it's very hard for them to wade through all the junk to figure out which products do what and what's, what's really would be helpful to our industry. So I would say um, try to help people in that. Uh, do things that you think would help others rather than just trying to snowball people for your own gain and profit. Well, we're going to see more and more of that across our industry, right, because it's a profitable industry to work in now. It didn't really used to be. So that's, that's something that I think... Uh, I would love to see us kind of stay classy in that regard. Um, the other thing that you can do to help and kind of make the world a better place is start thinking about how can I train the next generation. If I have the expertise to understand some of these things about software security and endpoint, whatever it is, how can I share that with somebody else, with maybe the new people or go out and whatever, teach a class at a conference, whatever it may be. That's something I'm really passionate about. And then again, whenever possible, think about how can I make this better across the industry, working upstream a little bit rather than just finding one more bug or whatever it may be in your uh, environment. So that's all I have for you. I hope you guys have a great tour con, and we'll see you around today.